Nice to see you by the club on the wall, so we can start. I can welcome you all to today's uh, major travel committee meeting. Um, in terms of apologies for absence, we've got those from John Dodd and Steve Kermode. I'm looking around the room, and John Stockton. I'm looking around the room, I think we've got four caps, otherwise. Yep, excellent. Um, second item is declaration of interest, and that's just the usual to remind everyone if there is anything either now or at any period during the meeting uh, that they need to declare, please do so accordingly. Um, I should probably also useful uh, for me to mention, uh, as I've seen just come in, uh, members might want to take a moment at the end of the meeting to go and look at the Transport Workers Memorial plaque that's been uh, cited just in the corner of the room. It was the old plaque from Hatton Garden that hasn't been on public display since we moved and we thought it was appropriate uh, to make sure uh, that that was recited here in a public place, particularly because this is the 70th anniversary um, of its dedication. So members might want to take a moment of quiet reflection after the meeting to, to look at that. Um, right, into uh, some of the agenda items then. Uh, the third item is the minutes of the last meeting. If I can move those as an accurate um, representation of the proceedings of the committee held on the 12th of February, if that's agreed. Lovely, I shall sign that accordingly. Item four, similarly, is for myself to move the proceedings of the general purposes subcommittee held on the 19th of February, if that's agreed. Item 5, Ken? Uh, could I move the uh, proceeding for performance of the review subcommittee held on the 23rd of March, 2015, sir? Yeah, is that agreed? Agreed. Excellent. Uh, item 6, Tony? Could I move the proceedings of the Austin Governments subcommittee held on the 23rd of March, 2015? Okay, is that agreed? Agreed. Excellent. And item number seven is again for myself to move the proceedings of the General Purposes Subcommittee that was held on the 26th of March, if that's agreeable. Agreed. Excellent. Okay, item eight is Transport for the North Next Steps. And Darren's going to present this for us. Thank you, Chair. Members will be aware that since May last year, the Northern Transport Authority has been working with the other city regions in the North on proposals to improve interregional connectivity. That was initially part of the, the One North project, and that's a link in which the FT, HS2, Network and Housing, you see, as part of the Transport for the North project. Uh, we reached a milestone last month uh, when the interim report, which is attached as an appendix to this report, uh, was launched and was submitted to the Secretary of State at an event, hosted by the Chair at the Port of Liverpool. Uh, the report sets out a number of proposals covering road and rail, passenger and freight, and inter and an intra regional transport, uh, and are summarised at Paris 4.3 to 4.7. In particular, I draw your attention to the recommendation in paragraph 4.3, which is for the creation of a new east-west high-speed rail line linking Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Hull and Newcastle. Uh, critically proposes that the line out of Liverpool could connect to the HS2 network which will provide the city region with direct high-speed rail service. Uh, she also point out that Mercer Travel has led the freight element of the, the TFM project, recognising the importance of the sectors of the city region. And here, the proposal is to carry out a comprehensive multimodal freight and logistics strategy for the north of England, which builds on our proposal to have a, a long-term freight strategy for the city region. Uh, there's now a temporary pause in the work. Uh, whilst the city regions review the, the financial and governance implications of the next phase of the work and look to formalise the relationship between the city regions as Transport for the North, uh, the Highways Agency, the FT, Network Rail and HS2 Limited, and agree the, the program of work needed to make uh, future milestones, including the comprehensive spending review, Network Rail's own processes, and the need to publish a final strategy this time next year. Uh, bring another report to the committee as the work progresses, but I'm happy to take any questions that may have now. That's great, thanks, Dan. Members, any questions or comments? John? Well, thanks, Chair. Um, it's a fantastic report, and I'm very pleased to see it before the committee. I'm also delighted with the um, success that we've had with it. One of the reasons London's transport network is so superb, because it is superb, is because decision makers use it. 
and with this bid, with this um, success, which is part of, mostly because of the fantastic officers we've got speaking to Whitehall civil servants, it makes the evolution for rail in the north much more achievable. And I think it's a testament to the quality and the calibre of the staff we have outside London, in the north, in the city region. And the sooner we get powers in our community or in our region for transport, the better we will be. We're on a journey. And I think our staff can serve a pass on the back, Chair. He, he, indeed, John, I don't think we could say it any better than that. I think it's, it's a testament to some of the great work that's happened right across the north. But very specifically, he and the engagement from the Liverpool City region, Darren's done a fantastic job of getting stuck in, as has Frank, as has um, David, as has Wayne and Julian, and many, many bit more people that are, that are countless to uh, to name, and I think uh, there's some really great progress that's come out of, um, of this. I'm particularly pleased with the fact that we've got that acknowledgement from the rest of the North, but crucially the part for transport, that one of the options that needs to be fully investigated is a full high-speed link from Liverpool going across towards Manchester as the first starting point of an east-west trans network that would get you to Yorkshire and the East Coast, but crucially with a link onto the HS2 network. That option can solve the city region's high speed requirements, east, west and north, south. We know in the city region that there's a compelling argument in case of why that has to happen. And I'm very confident over the next 12 months that you know, we will make sure that that case is fully heard so we can make sure that is the intervention that is introduced. But I think you're absolutely right, John. There's some fantastic work that's gone into this, but I do know the next 12 months of developing these options is going to involve even more hard and fantastic work and is incumbent on every single one of us to keep on banging that drum to make sure that that's the intervention that we get, because that will be what we need to transform um, not just our city region, but actually help to transform the North as well. Is there anything else anyone wants to add, Gordon? Thank you, Chair. Part of uh, the thing that's continued in the uh, in the report is the theme about highways. And uh, previous meeting, what I have mentioned is the fact is that we welcome the new improvements to road network in the north. But what we do have, we have a, a substantial funding gap. Uh, in many, many of these cases, there's the possible fund, uh, and it makes it makes a bit of a joke about pulling off the new roads into roads that are uh, heavily possible. Similarly, likewise, and the uh, the the four tracks for the east are beautiful. There's a recognition of Princess Way as being a major uh, linkage from there. The work that's currently going on, I have to say, Chair, doesn't seem to reflect due respect for the for the residents that I represent in the area with work disturbing them from two or three o'clock in the morning. So I do feel it's important that maybe we uh, get when you say uh, Representative of the local city region. To return to the report itself, 
It summarizes the key points and the invitations to tender for both the Northern and the Transpan and Express franchises and their implications for the city region. And I think as you read the reports, we need to bear in mind that we start from a higher baseline than anywhere else in the North because of the continued investment over the years that Mercy Travel has made in the city regions around that work. It's fair to say that the rest of the North would like what we already have. Um, so I think if we can consider the report in that context, we're getting additional services, evening and Sunday services on the St Helens line, some extra services in the early evenings between Southport and Manchester. On the line between Liverpool, Warrington and Manchester, there will, there will be a change. The current Liverpool Scarborough service transfers to the Chat Boss line and will, will run fast from Liverpool to Manchester, calling at Newfoundland Willows and St Helens Junction. On the Warrington line will be a new Northern Regional service, which will be a high quality train service virtually to the same standard as the current Transpennine Express services. And that's part of a, a network of northern regional services within the northern franchise that will come across the north. It's an uplifting quality on a number of routes that presently just do not have Transpennine standard of service but really deserve them. This feeds through to rolling stock as well. The rolling stock on those, on those routes will, from 2019, have to give time for the franchisee to procure suitable stock, will be the same standards as Transpennine. And that means that the, on some of those lines there will be high quality electric units as well. It's not just about new, the new diesels that's detailed in the report. The, the specification for the Northern Regional Network actually forces better electrics than the ones that have been transferred in for local services. So there's a, there's a game for us all there. Um, I'm sure also you'll be glad to note that the pace of diesel units will finally bite the dust by, by the end of 2019. And they, they will be replaced either by new vehicles or vehicles cascaded into the franchise, diesel and electric. And all the existing trains that are retained in both franchises will be refurbished to a very high standard. And the standard that's been that was quoted in, in discussions around this was the standard that we achieved with the Mersey Road units about 10 years ago when we completely gutted the interiors and, re and rebuilt them. That's the sort of standard we're looking for from Northern. Stations, well, ideal, in an ideal world, we'd have, had, we'd have had Mersey travel standards across the whole of the North. We did have to recognize that that was unaffordable, but we, we keep our own high standards and we we, we bring stations in the rest of the north up to as high a standard as we possibly can. And there is a, a specific provision to improve smaller stations which have been neglected for far too long. There's a station improvement fund which the franchisee will have to spend over 80% of on stations that are used by less than a quarter of a million people a year, which are typically the rural stations. Some of the stations on the Southport Manchester line will benefit from that, for example. Fares will continue to be regulated at the national standard, so an increase of no more than 1% over RPI was applied across a basket of fares. And that's a real win for us as well because there was originally a, a, a view taken that we would have to accept higher fare increases just to fund the investment in the north that these new franchises will bring. But uh, we fought the battle and we've won the battle for fares to remain at the national level. Um, one item I will draw your attention to is on-train staffing and driver, what's known as driver-controlled operation of doors. And the idea there is very much that on a, lot of our, on a lot of our lines, stations are close together. The guard is spending all this time just opening doors, doesn't get very far around the train. Passengers so passenger surveys have shown that Northern in particular doesn't score terribly well on visibility of staff and availability of staff to, to, to passengers. So the idea is that if the driver can take control of operation of train doors rather than the guard having to do it, then the, the guard is available to provide security, information and assistance to passengers and to make sure that they all have a ticket as well to give them the opportunity to buy tickets, which 
It's particularly important where you, you've got understaffed stations which may not have ticket sales facilities. And you could find yourself at the end of your journey in a, you know, coming up against a ticket barrier or, or even in a penalty fare area. So it's important that we have that visibility of staff on trains. And nowhere in the, in the franchise agreements does it, does it say staff will, that second member of staff will be removed from the train. And finally, franchise management will be a partnership between Rail North and the DFT. And again, I think Mercy Travel's experience managing the Mercy Rail Electrics concession is one of the things that gave the DFT confidence to extend the evolution further across the north. So I'll, I'll keep quiet from that point. I'm happy, I'm happy to take any questions. And uh, through you, Chair. Excellent question. I've got Ken. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, thanks for the excellent, well-rounded report. Uh, on the station refurbishment, I mean, lots of the stations outside, I mean, I've been banging the drum for Prescott for less because the majority don't meet the disabled access standards. I mean, to get Prescott, you've got to walk up the stairs, walk across. Um, it took me got halfway up the stairs, I have to sit down. I might look okay, but I'm registered disabled. Uh, um, you know, it is a problem for people to do this. Um, I know Network Rail are saying it costs about a million pounds to install this there. I mean, this is a belt and braces of trucks, you know. Uh, I'm sure a commercial lift wouldn't cost anywhere near that, but Network Rail has to do the belt and braces a bit. But again, you know, we need to be looking at the stations, refurbishing the stations, making them disabled friendly uh, for all our customers and of course attracting more customers. Thanks, Jim. Um, Wayne's going to say that one. Yeah, I'll say that one. Um, I think the draft is something we made um, by the council, I think um, it's a very appropriate point. I, I don't believe that the funding for things like this would come into this station group funds, sorry, um, that Julian has mentioned. Um, but certainly, as officers from Mesa Travel will continue to press for enhancements of um, the ticket stations with respect to compliance with the um, accessibility um, regulations. Spot will certainly qualify for the station improvement fund. It's, it's, it's used by under 250,000 passengers a year, so it's likely to be one of the higher priorities for that money. And at this stage, we can't say what the money will, the franchisee will choose to spend the money on it at any given station, but I would anticipate provision of ticket machines at some type stations will be quite a high priority, especially when you, you look at what's happened, for example, on the Scotrail franchise, where they spent quite a bit of money in putting ticket machines on, on, on unstaffed stations. So uh, watch this watch this space, but it's, it's certainly it certainly would uh, qualify for station improvement problem. Marlene and Les. Yeah. 
stations, extra journeys, and whatever. We still have some areas that serve vital services. Train gets a stop on Sunday, which is the most popular visit you can get for hospitals. So I would look to that as well. Whilst we're advancing and getting all these extra things, we can't leave urgent um, isolated. Because then we're falling into the trap that the North is left in and all these advanced issues going on elsewhere. We can give you some good news on that one, Councillor. Oh, Nicholson Park right. will get the Sunday service on December 17th when these changes are introduced. <laughs> We can't do it sooner because of the, the timetabling issues, but Eccleston Park and Grin will both get Sunday services. But Grin's great in Manchester. I know. I'm looking at the documentation as well. Not stop that. Anyone do you want to knock off? Back to the ground. Do you know, Joe, can I come back on that? I'm really pleased about this because it's only the last meeting for all the officers to the back went to France. And do you know what? I'm going to give them to buy a Christmas shopping list now. <laughs> because to get it so quick, I wouldn't believe it. I am delighted at that. Absolutely delighted. And I'm sure that the, the people in that area, uh, if I never get anything else, just make my day. Really make my day. Well, it's a great advert for devolution, how it works, isn't it? Fantastic. So, excellent. I've got Les next. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, great report. Obviously, lots of progress, as we've just heard. Nice to hear about the, the stations and the way it's going to be some of those. Um, also, nice to hear about your words on the, the guard, the second person on the train. Whilst I understand the, the theory behind giving the driver, I would hope that that's not a foundation being laid for removal of the second person in the future because I feel it's so important to keep that uh, second person on the train for passenger safety, passenger contact, and, and I hope that would always be our goal to keep that second person on the train. That's, that's exactly the intention behind this, to, to give better service to passengers by retaining the second person on the train. I've then got John and then I've got Terry. Thanks, Chair. Um, I welcome this report and I'm really impressed by the calibre again of the input it shows when we go for growth, when we're ambitious, when we put a bit together to central government, what we can achieve. I really welcome the paragraph in 4.5.3, um, the transformational nature required by rail work will achieve the government objective. And they're not just government objectives, they're our objectives, we negotiated them, of reducing subsidies by revenue growth and growth in the overall market rather than service reductions. I use these lines at least twice a day, and I'll tell you now, and I've said before, the train guards do not get about the train. They don't have the time to get about the train. <coughs> Often the train sits at a station with its doors closed because the train gets inspectors trying to get back into the cab. The transformational effect of having the driver operate the doors, the passengers will be quite substantial. It'll create quite a lot of wasted time delays, it'll make passengers feel safer, and it'll help complement our going for growth in passenger numbers, especially when we have our four carriage trains, um, which you can walk through from one end to the other, rather than either having two carriage trains or two sets of two carriages where you can't walk from one to the other at all. <coughs> I'm really pleased that any reduction in subsidy, 50% will be retained by um, Rail North to go forward into growth as there is more ambition left within us, plenty more ambitions indeed. I'm curious as to what level of discretion the franchisee has with regards to stations stopping. We have ambition, we've got new trains coming on, uh, electric trains which operate more quickly by accelerating and decelerating more quickly. Um, we've got policy to build more stations on the line as well. I'm slightly worried that we've adopted a policy where we've got a 
because it's a service station, for example, Carmel in my ward, but we might not have the capacity in the timetable. Well, we, I think we have got the capacity in the timetable. I'm slightly worried that we might not have the levers over the operators to make sure that they stop them. So my question is, how much discretion do operators have to stop the more varied destination stops, please, Chair? Could you do that in one cycle like you did for Garden? <laughs> yeah. um, right, well, the service specification is set out in terms of a minimum number of calls at each station on the, on the line of route. And overall, it is what's there now as a minimum. With some, some, some places there are, there are increases, but uh, they, don't, they don't have discretion to go below that specification at all. If we build a new station that's, co that's currently not committed, which Carmel isn't, then we would have to, ne we'll have to negotiate with the operator and through, through, uh, through Rail North to have a suitable pattern of services at that station. And to give you an idea of the way this would work, Warrington West is a station which is being built at the moment between Sankey and uh, Warrington Central. And, if, and the commitment there is that when the station is opened, you know, two trains an hour will stop there, but there will be a reduction in service at Sankey because the two stations are very close together. Now, Car Mill is not would not cause a reduction in service at any other station. It serves a completely a catchment that's completely new to rail. Um, you know, it doesn't serve an area where you can access rail other than by some other form of transport, whether it's driving, getting the bus, or cycling. So, with Car Mill, we just have we would have to negotiate. With the with this, the franchisee, the, the level of service at that station, as as we've done in the past with new stations elsewhere in, in the city region. That that's um, I welcome that news. Um, the Warrington Line is not electrified, though, is it? Uh, the Cheshire Lines route isn't isn't at this stage. No. Um, I'll t we'll, t we'll, t we'll talk a bit about that in a later you item. Just handled that for that one. The only reason I mention that is because the line that my station, hopefully my ward's station, has been built on, is currently being electrified. So it makes it even more possible to have a station stop there rather than in Warrington West, which is already timetabled. So it looks like the future is bright for Carmel. I was just going to add that Julian's absolutely right. Um, but at the moment, what we have to do is negotiate um, with a train operator with the Department of Transport for that to happen. One of the easier arrangements um, will be negotiating through the partnership. to Les's point and the point that John made in, in with regards to driver only operation. No RMT are not completely satisfied with franchises being moved to driver only operation. I know you've suggested that the, the guards protect revenue and so on and so forth, offers uh, passenger safety. But if there's nothing statutory within the franchise, then the operator themselves can effectively remove the guard and say we can we can operate with driver only which will not only be disparaging for customers, the RMT are not likely to take this line down and say, well, we'll, we'll accept that. There will be disruption. Um, the, this, is, this, is, this is a fear that not only I hold, but I hold for, for people who use, the, use public transport and use, use the same mm -hmm. networks to know that they've not only got a guard on, We've got a guard who's capable of operating the train should the worst happen to the driver. Uh, yeah, I was just going to, the, the, the terminology is quite important because um, originally the conversation was got a bit of confusion with driver and operation, which is where you only require one person on there. This is about the driver controlling the doors, to, uh, and that's just a, a transfer of that responsibility from the conductor currently into the driver. In the franchise agreement, um, the operator, so the train operator, will be um, incentivized both positively and negatively for a range of different things. So it will be measured on customer satisfaction with things like revenue protection, uh, customer service on board, customer information. So, so they can't just take all the staff off because those 
that performance will drop through the floor, uh, and therefore they get financially penalised for doing that, which is great, and they're saving the bank by taking the person off. So we're pushing very hard that the driver will have the ability to open and close the doors. But that's a positive thing about using the other member of staff then to do customer-based activities, including selling it and protecting revenue. Uh, we have had a number of um, discussions with uh, colleagues at the RMT to, to explain that argument. Um, clearly, they're, they're concerned for, for their members and making sure that, that there is retention of their, their jobs. I think the other um, thing is that what this will lead to is more trained miles and more trains operating across the north. So the requirement for the train operator clearly to recruit more of both drivers and onboard staff. So we're trying to ensure that this is about continuing to grow the market and provide excellent level of service. And, and we are still meeting with the colleagues in the RMT to, to continue the dialogue. Service, Ron. to inspect your safety critical work ID card accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're right. You know, the best way to give the best customer service to the passengers is to have the, the guard free to walk through the train. And furthermore, I think that's the best way of protecting jobs genuinely. If you're giving the best possible customer service and the most visible to all the customers, that ensures the long-term future of that vital role of a guard on the train giving customer service to all the passengers involved. Um, I was just going to add to all of those kind of useful points that I think this is a really good um, success um, that's come out of this. I remember when uh, this process of Rail North first started and the conversation was much more about, well, that might be the North's aspirations, but there's not enough money, so what are you going to cut? Now, we knew back then that wasn't acceptable, and we've all collectively engaged to make sure that didn't become a reality. And it's not only that it hasn't been a reality of a shrinking railway, as you can see, what's before you is a transformational, growing railway. We've all got our own favourites in terms of what's um, coming out. Marlene's obviously got Garswood for me. It's the scrapping of the... Uh, oh, Eccleston Park, sorry. Get that right. For me, it's the scrapping of the Pacer fleet um, and particularly seeing off any uh, fares increases over and above um, the national policies accordingly. I think genuinely we need to pay tribute to all of our officers. But particularly David, um, I think we shouldn't um, lose sight of the fact that David has not only been our lead officer for Mersey Travel in this process, he's been the lead officer for the whole north of England throughout this process. And actually he's been able to demonstrate how the north of England coming together, making that clear, coherent, compelling argument about how not only we need a growing, transformed railway for our passengers, but even more importantly for the communities that it serves and the economy that it serves, that actually we've broken some of the down in terms of uh, the arguments that the DFT weren't here in the early days. So genuinely, I think we should take that off to everything that David's achieved throughout this process. I will say though, the battle is not yet uh, completely over because once we've secured some fantastic things in the invitation to tender, we still need to nail down a full Liverpool to Scotland service as part of Transparent Express. It's an option, let's make sure it's a reality. So again, it's incumbent on all of us to keep punching our way to, to get that direct train we want to see to complete this transformational package. But with all of that in mind, if I can uh, move the recommendations in paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Excellent. And moving on um, with the thought that uh, John held previously, Northern Sparks Electrification Task Force reports, Julian. Well, here's the report. Um, the task force. The task force was three MPs: Andrew Jones, the MP for Harrogate; 
Hugh Swales, the MP for Redcar and Cleveland, and uh, Julie Hilling, the MP for Bolton West, and two council leaders, one from each side of the Pennines, uh, Councillor Terry O'Neill from Warrington and Dave Green from Bradford. And they were supported by a team of officers drawn from drawn from Rail North, from across the north, and by, by consultants. The question they were asked was, in what sequence should the North's railways be electrified to maximise the economic benefits to the north? So it wasn't a case of should the lines be electrified, it was in which order should we do it. And to answer that question, we divided the railway up into roughly, I think it's 32 individual routes. That's just the way services and the geography hangs, hangs together very best. And they came out when we analysed them in, in roughly in three tiers. The first tier, the highest priority, was 12 routes. And the recommendation there was that as soon as, as, soon as possible we should start looking for the business cases for electrification and start doing some more detailed design work. The second tier was eight routes, which were a medium priority, and the bottom tier was 12 routes of quite a low priority, and they were, unsurprisingly, they were mainly road and branch lines, and lines in the, you know, very likely populated parts of the north. The top three routes, I don't think, would surprise anyone, but were the Cobble Valley routes, which is from Preston and Manchester on this side of the Pennines, across through East Lancashire and through, through Rochdale to Halifax, Bradford and Leeds. The second one was the Cheshire Lines route from Liverpool to Warrington and Manchester. And the third one was the, were the, was the group of lines from Southport and Kirby through Wigan into Manchester. So two out of the top three routes served the city region. Um, caveat though is it doesn't mean they get electrified anytime soon because electrification resources across the UK are fully committed up to at least 2020. So the earliest we can see any further electrification of routes that haven't been committed is after 2020 when the electrification from up the North Trans Pennine route across from Liverpool to York is complete. And at that stage all of the priorities for the north will have to be considered in the national context. So, with those caveats, we still we've, we still have a report that says it's vitally important not just to local city region but to the whole of the north of England for the, the two key diesel work routes into the Liverpool city region to be electrified and to be electrified soon. Julie, members, any questions or comments? Go. On. Thank you for that. Well, I think we have to remember, though, that there's some major electrification schemes taking place outside Northern England. It's not just the, the lines in the northwest and the Trans Pennine routes. There's the Great Western Main Line from London Paddington to Bristol and Cardiff. There's the Midland Main Line from London St Pancras up to Sheffield. And there are major electrification schemes in Scotland as well at the moment, and some other schemes in the West Midlands. So there's a very heavy program of electrification. I'm quite delighted after 38 years working in railways that 
lines that I was pushing for in the 1970s to be electrified, like the Jack Moss and the St. Helens line, that are finally getting done. I just hope it doesn't take 38 years for these lines to be done. But you know, the, the tide has turned with electrification. It's simply now a case of we're doing so much that we've run out of trained staff to do it. One of the interesting aspects about this is planned out by six, seven years often, that it's, it's, it will encourage the, uh, the introduction of new homes of people onto it, rather than just uh, the old models being thrown onto the rail lines. And I think that's an important aspect that's, uh, that's touched on a little bit in the report. So uh, make sure we get new homes stock as well. We well, we can try. I mean, the, when the, the lines to the northwest of Leeds were electrified, they started with cascaded rolling stock, and within a few years, new units were bought for them because it, they, it had grown their business on the route so much. So we can do the same here, hopefully. Yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a good report, and I think it, it shows that by having a strategy, having lobbying groups uh, and all sort of working together that you can come out with the results and this result seems very beneficial uh, from you know, the city region's point of view. Uh, but my question was was in sort of an earlier meeting with Liam was, if this strategy seems to be working there, what sort of strategies and lobbying groups and um, you know, networking are we doing to achieve our other aims, which are the instant Wrexham electrification. And it does mention the North Wales coastline being advantageous to us. And I, I just wonder whether it would be wise of this um, group to have a report on what we're doing, uh, who we're doing it with, uh, and, and what the long-term strategy could be uh, for us and what other uh, goals uh, the other side of the, uh, the, the North England, maybe like you know, North Wales. And I know the report authors will not be these people, it will be Welsh government and so on, but I'm just wondering how we are using our maximum influence to get our, our, our main aims. Yeah, we, can, we can do that. I, I, was, I was going to make exactly the same point. If you look at these three reports together, um, what's happened is the, uh, the North, um, so the local politicians, their MPs, uh, with support by businesses, etc., made a really compelling case for investment in strategic railways, local railway services, and then electrification. Um, and, and actually made a really compelling argument but by actually getting our act together and getting all the right people saying all the right things consistently. We've got a good set of uh, aspirations here. I think what we do need to do is make sure that the, on these three, we just continue to bang the drum, because clearly um, elsewhere in the UK are doing a similar thing. Uh, but what we need to do is make sure that we're using this work and this evidence to continue to make that case so that it doesn't get uh, slipped off the agenda in a new, new government. And this is exactly the approach we're trying to take on the North Wales linkages by getting ourselves, people in the Welsh government and the interest groups in those areas, all, all around the same idea, and they're trying to do the evidence of it. We will produce a report for the next meeting by explaining how that's working. And just to sort of add to that, uh, yesterday I met with Edwina Hart, who's the um, Minister in the Welsh Assembly Government with responsibility for transport on the progress we're making on Halton Curve on Bits and Wrexham. So there's some good practical progress on our links to our friends, family and colleagues to our west in North Wales. Um, if there's no further...